from the oldest city in the USA, St. Augustine tonight, with our guest, and Colby, Greg White. And musical guest, the Carpet Bagger. With your host, Jorge Rivera. Beautiful Arctic night. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Love it. We're in Florida. I want to start by thanking the Lincolnville Museum and the Cultural Center, uh, Ancient City Brewery, the St. John's Cultural Council, uh, also Vector Vision, see the world in a new way, uh, art and life in 3D is their website. And look at Shirley. Look at the flowers by Shirley. <laughs> We also got our banner back. Uh, the uh, classical theater people were holding it hostage. Uh, I, I gave them Bitcoin for it. Uh, but the, the currency crashed after I gave them the money, so that's good. So we have back our beautiful Bayfront. Uh, wow, uh, there's so much news in the news. I think some, something that was really interesting. In England, uh, the pubs are in a crisis. They've been on a crisis for a long time. In England, they're, they're closing about 1,000 pubs a year. And so far, they're up to 11,000. Well, this week, their oldest, it's a little over a thousand year old pub called the Old, old uh, Fighting Cooks. That's what they're called. Uh, they, they closed. Uh, they've been serving beer there for almost over a thousand years. Uh, the pandemic hit them. Also, you know, young people now are going to uh, theme bars, they're going to restaurants, they're going to wine bars. And the pub has kind of lost its, its place in, in English um, everyday life. It's not like it used to be. Another piece of news was Mount Everest. Mount Everest, the largest glacier on Mount Everest is, is melting at an incredible, incredible speed. Everyone's kind of down on that, which means that um, a lot of climbers are going to deal with more rock when they climb than ice in the years to come. So the reason I brought that up is as a public announcement in case anyone here is, is planning to climb on Everest anytime soon. They found a cat in Longwood, Longwood, Florida, Orlando area. They found this cat and someone took it to the vet and the vet did the scan and had a chip on it. They found the phone number of the owner, they called the owner, they said, we found your cat. And he said, I don't own a cat, what are you talking about? And so they got in the discussion and slowly described the cat to him and he said, I did have a cat like that seven years ago. We lost them, we put posters in the neighborhood. What a pathetic cat to come to Disney World. <laughs> it took, I, took them seven years to get here, I guess. But they found him and they were both reunited at last. But I thought, well, what a weird story. The chip, well, you know at least the chips do work. <laughs> right, seven years. The things still work. It's not a Star Trek. Um, Brady, Brady, the quarterback, he's retiring. I will leave it when I see it. But he uh, he bought some property out in Indian Creek. It's known as the Billionaire Bunker, and it's about an, an hour northeast of Miami. It's just for billionaires. This little island. It's only about 86 people live there. They have their own private army, or should I say, police. And uh, they, they go around the waters of the island. There's only one way to get on it. So he bought this house, and he hit it with a wrecking ball. As soon as he bought it, he just took it down to the ground. He wants to build something that's modern and reflects his taste, etc., etc., etc. I don't know what's funnier. Remember the story that I said there was a truck in Pennsylvania that crashed and had a hundred monkeys and three monkeys were missing? I thought that was hilarious. Well, now here's another one. In the Pentagon, in one of their most secured areas, they found a big brown chicken. <laughs> they found a brown chicken. They don't know where it came from. That's how, the, thank God it was an Al-Qaeda dressed as a chicken. But they found this brown chicken. They called it Henny Penny. 
uh, they didn't do chicken dinner with it. They gave it to a sanctuary, took the chicken. But they still, the Pentagon doesn't know how brown chicken got into the security area. This, this is what's funny. I mean, oh, it's funny and it's scary at the same time, okay? All right, all right. Another thing, I don't want to alarm you, so I won't tell you we're in Florida, but a guy in Florida was walking with his dog, and in the mall, right by the mall, you know I have little trees by the mall today, there was a Burmese pipe, huge Burmese pipe. Those things can actually eat a small pony, in case you didn't know. They'll, they'll crush it and just swallow it. So, if your kids are missing in the mall, you might worry a little bit. You know, that's why I'm not telling you where it was found here in Florida. But they called the rescue people and they removed the, the pipe. And they're all, they're growing all over the Everglades. They're eating alligators. These things are killing alligators. So, so much for the local pet shop. Another, another funny story. Another, this guy in Florida, I mean, Florida is just full of wonderful news. In Florida, this guy comes home and his pavement is missing. To the garage, it's gone. All the pavers are gone. They stole his driveway, and they they did catch the guy. Um, but only in Florida. That's why I say, when you lay a paver a driveway, put crazy glue on it right away. Lots of it, lots of it. So if you steal, it's going to be an awkward piece, and you better be really strong to carry something that large. So another story that I thought was wonderful. You know, they had the. Um, the volcano that erupted in Tonga, that the whole world felt it some way or another. Well, one Tongan guy, as the tsunami was coming, climbed up the tree with his niece. The thing came so it took him away out to sea. This guy was swimming for over 24 hours. He swam to an island, it was deserted, went back in the water, swam to another island, nothing. He made it to a third island, where he collapsed and they, they took him and they reunited him with his family though it's not clear about the niece who was on another tree next to him but his nickname now in the Tongan Islands is Aquaman <laughs> they call him Aquaman I mean wow would you imagine that and also something doesn't come and eat you in the, at night while you're s s threading water and swimming oh. the last piece of news was very interesting a guy was sent by his wife to go get chicken for dinner as he went in, he put up a scratch lotto, won $100,000. My question is, did he still buy the chicken? <laughs> or did he order up? So the end of the story is, winner, winner, chicken dinner. <laughs> so, so what I got you for tonight, no chicken, and there's no scratch off. But I have an incredible band. I'm going to leave you with the carpetbaggers. We're going to go three tunes tonight. Uh, this first one is off our first, see our newest CD called Back Again, and it's Best Them Blinds, a feature of uh, Tony and Sue on this.
back ladies and gentlemen we're back I got, I got all these wires sticking out of me look I'm in the white witness protection plan here but I'll survive I'm here with Ann Colby I thank you so much look at you your dress magnificent this is 1800 Oh, 1900. 19, yes. Early 1900 guard. I like to challenge, uh, I, I, I like to channel the uh, ladies that I'm so proud of. All right. And Ann Colby is an author, but a lot of you don't know that Ann Colby was the lawyer for Orlando, like for what, two decades or something oh, like that? Oh, heavens no. no? Uh, for a while, I uh -huh. also represented uh, Seminole County, Longwood with uh -huh. the cat, with <laughs> uh, the, uh, uh, Altamont Springs, and okay. a number of other cities okay. in Central Florida. All right. 42 years. Mm -hmm. Her other hobby <laughs> is uh, she's the author of this book. It is called Wicked St. Augustine. I'm going to talk about this. This is th this, ladies and gentlemen. I read this. Once you start, you can't stop. It's a short read, but it's so powerful. It's 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 like something that is extremely potent. It's it's wonderful, and uh, with pictures and all sorts of things. But let's talk a little bit about you. You're you're originally from where? Where were you born? I was born at Camp Lejeune in North Carolina. Mm. My father was in the Marine Corps. Oh wow! Hoorah! Yeah, hoorah! Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. He, he he made a career out of the. He the, did. Yeah. He did. Although when he retired from the Marine Corps, he came to Florida and went to work for Martin Marietta yeah, at the time. Martin, yes. yes, so I came here very young. I was seven years old wow. and have been here ever since. Wow, so you're really a Floridian. Pretty much. Yes, yes. So, so now um, you spent all this time working in, in law and government. Mm -hmm. did, did you find this kind of uh, boring in any way, shape or form? I pretty much hated it. Um, <laughs> Because you're a lawyer, and uh -huh. I worked for politicians who Ooh. are the worst people to work for. 
all of them, all of them. So, so you were you were ready to you were ready to get out of there. Yes, I, I calculated how much I would need to retire pretty much every single day of my career. <laughs> and when I hit the point where I wouldn't starve to death, I said goodbye. I'm retiring and going to do now what I want to do, which mm, is right. Right. So, so now you come. Now, you've been visiting St. Augustine all this time. Yes, yes. Since you were a little girl or something yes, like this, that? Yes, since, uh, uh, since my parents first came to, to Florida, this was the only place we could afford to go for vacations. So we came from Orlando to St. Augustine. So, so you knew the city quite pretty well. Pretty much then. every vacation, yeah. So, so you knew you were going to retire here then? Yes, yes, mm. I knew that. Mm. And so now this book is amazing. Um, it's amazing there's not a contract out for you, um, <laughs> but they're, all the characters are gone, so... No, they're not. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're going to get into that in a bit. All right. And certainly their families are still <laughs> fine and healthy here yes, in St. Augustine. Yes. So, so now, this book, if you had to sum it in a, in, a, in, a, in a sentence, what is this book about, you would say? This is the history of St. Augustine that no one else will tell you about. Okay, all right. Now, 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 now you were saying that when we were speaking, it was very interesting, you said that New Orleans celebrates its history of vice. Absolutely. And, and there are it, plaques it, everywhere. It makes a great deal of money out of its history of vice as yes. well, still today. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Storyville lasted, uh, what, 17 years mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. in, in New Orleans, and mm -hmm. our red light district lasted, oh, approximately 450 years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I, I think we have a leg up on New Orleans, but but what amazed me was that New Orleans really does celebrate it. When I came to St. Augustine, after when I retired, first day I'm out, where is the history of our vice industries? We are so similar to New Orleans in our, how we are founded, that we're a military town, a fishing town, uh, a tourist town. Where are the vice industries? I talked to the tour guides. Nope, okay. never happened here. I talked to the historical society. Let me, let me stop you right there for an audio thing. Make sure that audio button that's flashing is not flashing. If it is flashing, the, the recorder on that side. Can I see anybody? It's working? It's good? Okay. So I just want to make sure we're recording this. Oh, okay. <laughs> so. Okay. We are, we are wired for the witness protection plan. Right. Yes. <laughs> So, so you were saying the historical? The historical society? Nope, it never happened here. We were a good Catholic town and there was nothing untoward that happened here. So I just decided to prove it. Uh -huh. <laughs> and it took me three years of searching. I mean, we were, our, our vice history was very well hidden. Uh, they had gone to great lengths, particularly Mr. Flagler, had gone to great lengths to bury it. Mm, mm. Yes. And uh, so I had to search in moldy boxes and through crumbling papers and crumbling cassette rec uh, recordings and interview some really, really old people uh, and, and was able to piece it all together that we had a spectacular spectacular vice history. Now, well, and, let me stop you yes. right here. One of the gems you said you found was the tapes yes. that were crumbling, audio yes. tapes that were done in the 70s. They were done in the 1970s from uh, very early uh, you know, 1900s, I would say, from uh, citizens who were here during the early 1900s. And while uh, going through those tapes, which are disintegrating as we, as we sit here, uh, and really should be digitized. Everybody contribute money to the Historical Society so they can get those tapes digitized because they are an amazing source of St. Augustine history. You will not only hear about, you know, how the, the Bridge of Lions got built and, you know, how, which ships used to go to Volano Beach and how the, how the families used to, to live here in St. Augustine, but you will hear a ton about the brothels and uh, uh, you, you find information, and some of our best citizens were absolutely complimentary about, they said, 
St. Augustine went all to hell when the vice industry stopped operating. Now, now, now you said, you said um, when I asked you, was Wicked St. Augustine your original title? You said no. No, it wasn't. It, it, was, was. it was to make Rome howl was the original. Uh, now, okay. And, and, that, and that was said by it who? Was, it was said by a judge in St. Augustine in the late 1800s when he was speaking about the number of brothels in, in St. Augustine. It was enough to make Rome howl and knights, uh, and, and I forget the whole thing, but it was <laughs> the, the, uh, um, it, it, there were enough brothels to make Rome howl in, in St. Augustine. Now, now in your book, there was, there was two women that really stuck out on the, because you divide your book into, what are the pillars of vice that you cover? I cover uh, gambling. We have a great town for gambling, uh, great, it still is, still is, I might add. Uh, uh, production of illegal alcohol, now mm -hmm. it's legal, but we still produce it, we haven't changed much. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. prostitution, the brothels. Mm -hmm. And then one of the, there were like two ladies that really stuck out in the book, yes. which was a white one and a black one. Yes. And the, the black one would supply colored girls to those who wanted nope. to, not always? No, nope. they, they both supplied every form of woman. It was more, <laughs> it was, it was <laughs> less about color and more about what services she was willing to provide. <laughs> This is too good. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and what was her, but, but the thing is they were great property owners. Yes, absolutely. Uh, in particularly Blanche Altavilla. Yes, Blanche was the... the Blanche one. was the white madam. Her, her base of operations was in West St. Augustine. Her, her primary brothel was the, is now the Chase Funeral Home. <laughs> and the three, the three streets that surround the Chase Funeral Home are all named after her. Blanche Lane, Travis Place, and Travis Lane. Her, her maiden name was Travis. Right. And, uh, and she owned, uh, that whole block was brothels, taverns, and uh, gambling halls. Mm. For, until 1953, from 1882 wow. until 1953. That's about when she died, right? She died in 1953 at the age of 93. Wow. Yes. So vice can keep you young. Still, <laughs> still working. Wow. And Blanche Altavilla owned almost, at the time of her death, owned almost all of West Augustine. Mm. As a matter of fact, she had dedicated it to the city in 1950. 42, I believe it was, and it's now known as the Altavilla subdivision. Wow, wow. And, and then there was the other lady, Ozzie? Ozzie. O-C-I-E, O-C Martin. She owned three brothels uh, here in, in the downtown St. Augustine area. She owned uh, one on Bridge Street. She owned one on Park Place. And she owned one on A1A just on the outskirts of town. That was for the low rollers. The other two were for the high rollers. <laughs> and I might add that the mortgages on all of those properties were held by Blanche Altavilla. Mm -hmm. Oh, it was a very, it was a very united but, group but, of but women. The other thing is that Blanche was friends with one of our presidents. Oh yes, absolutely. Um, we have, of course, everyone knows who our president was. I mean, St. Augustine's very own, spent 21 seasons here as the guest of the Flaglers. Um, stayed here, uh, played golf here. What was his name? What was his name? Turn Warren G. Harding. <laughs> Warren G. Harding was born in 1865 in Marion, Ohio. Blanche Altavilo was born in 1860 in Marion, Ohio, and they knew each other from back in the day. Mm. So well, he when would he supply lawyers and stuff to help her out, oh, did he? When he? No, he didn't. He did, she didn't need lawyers in this town. She had a, a lawyer on retainer who, by the way, inherited her entire estate. Wow. Uh, he was a Michler. <laughs> ah, he was a Michler. Michler. And uh, Bertram Michler, as a matter of fact, and uh, uh, she um, uh, she pretty much owned the town when it came to judges, and 
the police. Uh -huh. She was arrested 11 times for various and assorted, usually around uh, election time. She was arrested 11 times, and each Doesn't and every change. time, her bail was posted by the St. John's County Sheriff. Oh, <laughs> oh boy, oh boy. Yes. Now, now, the other thing that I found interesting when it came to bootlegging, uh, <laughs> that all these politicians and officials would be passing all these um, prohibition laws calling St. John's County a dry county. Yes. But at night, they would weigh there by the bayfront when the tide, because oh, yes, the fishermen absolutely. would bring contraband from Cuba and from the West Indies, yes. so they could get their booze. Yes, uh, right, the, 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 the old docks that are located right at the foot of the San Sebastian Bridge, on the same side as the winery, um, where that was the spot where most of the illegal bonded liquor came in to St. Augustine every single night. And they would line up. One of the uh, gentlemen who's, who I listened to his interview in the, the old cassette tapes um, said that uh, every night there was a long stretch of black cars that went all the way back from the San Sebastian River to the Ponce Leon Hotel and it was everybody waiting for their liquor, their bonded liquor. That was just the bonded liquor. It didn't have anything to do with the bootleg mm -hmm. liquor. And we, we produced about 200,000 gallons a month in St. Augustine. Wow, and that's being a dry, a, a yeah. dry county. This is a dry <laughs> county. Uh, one, of, one of the interview, the interviews that I listened to, they said, the, one of the, the gentleman commented, observance of prohibition in St. Augustine was very poor. <laughs> <laughs> that is so. So how, how, how does Flagler come in when it comes into the gambling and, and the prostitution? How does, does, how does Flagler come in the picture here? It's, it's actually rather interesting. Mr. Flagler, of course, was wanted St. Augustine to be a veritable Disney world of, of his time. He owned all the newspapers. He promptly made sure that no information about St. Augustine's uh, other entertainments, I mean, other than, you know, picking citrus and looking at alligators, <laughs> that none of that made the papers. But on the other hand, he totally supported it. Uh, he supported the Zareda Club, which was very prominent for its gambling and its illegal liquor. He supported the Bacchus Club, which was across from the, uh, the right across from the Ponce de Leon um, Port Cochere, so that the when when your rich uh, tourists came in, they would come to the uh, to the uh, Ponce de Leon Hotel. The ladies would get out, go to their rooms. The gentlemen would go get out and then go to the Bacchus Club, where they had uh, well gambling, liquor, and women. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, I mean, they had to be entertained. Right. What else are you going to do with very wealthy tourists? Right. Now, now you're now the, it's interesting. Your book starts with Pedro Menendez. Yes. And well, it, that's start, when it started. Yes, and it started with an incident of a man giving a gift to a woman. Yes, of course that was four months after after prostitution had been introduced to St. Augustine. We know the exact date it, be, it began, and that was September seventh, fifteen sixty-five. Uh, Menendez landed with he he landed with a master brewer, all kinds of uh, gambling equipment and a, a, a group of women who were specifically there to uh, help maintain peace in the colony. Uh, they had 900 soldiers and sailors with them and a decree from the Spanish king that they were not to consort. They were not to consort with the soldiers and sailors, so somebody had to. And so Menendez brought a group of women with him. And uh, the incident you spoke about was, uh, uh, well, after they'd been banned from the mainland for, uh, 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 well, some very terrible incidents I involving the Tamakuan women uh, who were, uh, who in their society were considered equal to the men, but the Sp in the Spanish society, women were not equal to the men, to put it mildly. So they had some trouble there. Let me stop you right here. Oh. Use the microphone, because this okay. one, though, is on. It tripped up, yeah, it tripped the signal. Don't know why. Oh, okay. Can everybody hear me? All right, good. 
Anyway, <laughs> so these women had to be there to, maintain, to help maintain the peace of the community. And um, the incident you, you speak of was the first mention of prostitution in St. Augustine. It was about four months after Menendez landed and a soldier was disciplined for giving a gift of cloth to one of the prostitutes. And he did it at the city well, in public, in front of everyone. So that was just not a proper thing to do. So they, he gave that gift in, uh, to a prostitute in front of every, and that's four months after they landed? Yes. Wow, that's like, well, the mass was cold by now, yes. So, <laughs> yes, which they had when they landed. So, so this was, so th now you say when the Americans took over, uh, a, a lot of these women, okay, there were two things I found interesting. Number one, these women kept calling themselves widows while their husbands were alive or they didn't have husbands in the first place. Yes, uh, the reason all of the women called themselves widows, and by the way, Blanche Altavilla, she, she had a husband for a very, who was uh, like 24 years younger than her. Um, uh, she had a husband for about four years, and then she decided she was gonna, she didn't really need him. Uh, so, so she divorced him. It was all a very happily organized affair. He promptly then married one of the leading heiresses in town, and uh, her former husband and his new young heiress wife then moved in with Blanche and lived with her until their deaths. Wow. A very wow. nice situation. Uh, it, anyway, they um, they. Blanche always called herself a widow. Uh, all of the, um, uh, the bra uh, brothel keepers called themselves widows because they had more legal rights as widows mm, than they did as just expensive. plain women or and certainly no legal rights in the United States as, uh, as uh, wives or single women. Yes, and uh, the last point, because we're running out of time, is when Florida changed hands from the Spaniards to the Americans, mm -hmm. most of the women lost their rights, all the rights that the Spaniards had given what them. What few rights they had under right. the Spanish, right. they then lost even more right. uh, under the Americans, and, yes. But the Americans found that this prostitution, gambling, liquor thing would make lots of money if they taxed it. Absolutely. I mean, that's what happens <laughs> when America <laughs> comes in, the United States comes in and takes over something. Uh, they immediately, because they're Puritans here, they're Protestants, not Catholics, they immediately decided we have to regulate all of this. We have to do something to show that we disapprove of these activities, but we don't actually want to get rid of them uh, because they're so much fun. And, uh, and so instead, they license and tax everything. So at that point in time, in 1821, our brothels, our prostitutes, our alcohol producers, our gambling halls all started to be uh, regulated. Mm -hmm. And there was even a license tax on pool halls. Did you know we had the first pool hall in the New World? Wow. Here in St. Augustine. And wow. We'll, 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 leave it, we'll leave it at that note with the line from Casablanca. I'm shocked, shocked that gambling is going on here. <laughs> no, you didn't even hear. You didn't even hear about what women, you know, we talk about all these activities that men are allowed to do. They go to the brothels. They're the ones that are gambling. That women aren't even pro allowed to have or possess alcohol in St. Augustine until the 1930s, wow. legally. Wow. So what did we do for women? What did we have for women? They had their own place to go. Mm -hmm. It was on the corner of Cathedral Place and Avenida Menendez, and it was... <laughs> advertised on the front page of the St. Augustine record as a place where women, preferably wealthy women, could go and relax in the privacy of their own lounges and enjoy their opium, cocaine, heroin, yes. or morphine. Yes, Sam, Sam Woe, Sam Woe. That's where macaroons is now. I think they're still there. They still sell macaroons. Don't ask for heroin. You yes, won't get it there. Yes, that was an opium den run by a Chinese uh, laundromat. Yep. It was a laundromat and it fronted an opium den. I mean, this book is amazing. The pictures are there. The pictures are there. The documents are there. Uh, and, uh, 
So a whole, a whole new synod. I thank you so much. Thank you. It, it was a pleasure. I'll take okay. that from you. The mics right. are working now. And um, let's give her another hand. Oh. We'll be back after these messages. everybody we're back <laughs> with, back with, with mr. Greg white I invited Greg uh, we had this great conversation I brought him because he's a, a community leader in, in West st. Augustine and uh, we had a frank discussion of the history of, of West st. Augustine uh, the past the present and the future uh, the good the bad and the ugly hmm. And uh, so it was, it was a very, and I said, you know, I, I need to have him on the show. Uh, it's, it's a great conversation. So we're gonna be frank about it here. Let me set my, my timer here real, real quick. So we were talking about West St. Augustine. We know so little about St. Augustine and we live a block away. Mm -hmm. um, also, we know that West St. Augustine is, is, is a place that needs development, True. needs money, needs to improve. I think Fidel Castro used to say, the rich and poor in America live a block away. And uh, <laughs> that's, that's very much so in many, many cities. And the tracks are there, which are famous all through. Um, I was talking with Ann Colby when we had the discussion. We talked about Eatonville in Orlando and how the tracks, once separate. again, separate um, a, a group of people. Um, I think the dichotomy, when it's most intense, like in Israel or, or in North, Northern Ireland, is they built a wall but a literal concrete wall to separate two groups of people. So um, now you, you, were, you were born, where were you born, Greg? Actually born in Putnam County in a big city called Johnson Crossroad. Uh, <laughs> Crossroad. <laughs> so that's, that, that tells you right there, the skyscrapers are enormous. Um, and so how old were you when you came to St. Augustine? Uh, actually I was in the sixth grade, about 10 years old, and oh, no. been here ever since more. more. And you've been there ever since now? Yes. Uh, I, I took a trip to Bronx, New York for one calendar year. Hey. And it only took one great Northeasterner to let me know I'm a Southern boy. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, well, there was a writer once that said, my coldest winter was a summer in San Francisco. That, that kind of thing. Um, so, so now, when you see your childhood in, in West St. Augustine, how, how was your childhood? How would you say your childhood? Well, actually, the childhood, uh, of course, was great because that was the only thing that we knew at, at that particular time. Everyone had their certain areas in, in which they began and sometimes, unfortunately, stay in that same place. So my childhood was typical of any black uh, during the 60s mm -hmm. uh, in St. Augustine. It's, it's very interesting. The first time uh, we were talking, this, the first time you had any, inter any serious interaction with, with white people was when you were drafted or in the military. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I got drafted in uh, July 1967. Never forget that date. Uh -huh. And anybody in the military have a uh, your uh, serial number. My serial number is US 67096686. And I was only in there two years. I spent a year in Vietnam and got a chance to actually sleep in the barracks uh, with, with Hispanics, with whites, and other, other uh, folks from wow. other areas like wow. LA, Detroit, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Great you were, experience. You were a combat. Uh Combat veteran, yes. artillery. I yes, I was in artillery, thing. correct. Wow. Yeah. You left the Spec 4, was it? Uh, spec 4, you recall, is excellent. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, so, now, so now, wow, that must be wild that you're in this very black world because it, that's the way it is. Mm -hmm. Now you step out. They say the most colorblind institution is the U.S. military. Would you agree with that? I agree, totally. Wow. Totally, especially in combat. <laughs> Especially in combat. Yes, okay. yes. I, I remember uh, Rocky Blyer, I got to meet him several months ago. He was giving a speech and he was talking how his, he, was, he was drafted. As Pittsburgh had just taken him and he got drafted and he went and he was, uh, he was mor mortal, not mortally, but he was a grenade blew up and tore his leg. And they dragged him through the jungle because they got overrun by the Vietnamese and they, they left him. 
at some point they just couldn't drag him anymore and they said we're leaving you but we will come back and he mm -hmm. said yeah right so they left him there and he said out of the jungle came these black hands that picked him up and put him over the shoulder and just carried him that seemed endless and eventually put him in a helicopter and he never knew who that black guy was but he said he, he saw me not as a white man but he saw me as a, a brother in arms, brother in a arms. blood brother. My blood was all over him because he was bleeding so profusely. So it's interesting how the military can change the mind of so many people in combat, I as agree. you said. I agree, mm -hmm. totally. So, so now you come back to St. Augustine, mm -hmm. and you must feel different, but the rules are the rules. <laughs> the rules still the rules. And yeah, I came back in uh, July 1969, mm -hmm. and of course some of the rules that existed uh, during 63 uh, mm -hmm. in 1964, when Martin Luther King, Andrew Young, and the civil civil rights folks was here during that era. Right. But that's not too far removed from right. 1969. So some of the issues uh, that was there in 63, 64 still existed, unfortunately, uh, in 1969. Right. Now, you were overseas when King got assassinated then? Uh, no, I was actually in Washington State oh. in April. He got assassinated in April, and I was in Washington State and uh, I was with the AmeriCal Division. Uh, General Colin Powell is famous uh, for the AmeriCal uh, Division. And we actually uh, did riot training in Washington State. Uh, we was gonna either be deployed to Detroit or Southeast Asia. <laughs> okay. Someone would say, what's the difference? You know? Yeah, 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 that's a, that's a tough one. At least you got Motowns in Detroit. It, it, right, exactly. You know? so, so, wow. Um, so what, what do you recall was your first time where you suddenly got involved with the community? What triggered it? Well, that's a very good question. I, I still live in West Augustine. I still love West Augustine. That's my community. Mm -hmm. uh, my granddaughter was staying with us at the time, and she was actually going to middle school. And my wife and I could stand on the porch and watch, watch our granddaughter walk to the corner of uh, Pearl and Volusia, okay, and the bus would pick them up, pick her up, and then of course bring her back, et cetera. Well, during this era, this is in the 80s, when the prostitution and the drugs was very heavy mm, in West Augustine. The crack, the crack right, epidemic. The crack, crack epidemic, crack exactly. Aids, so what took place is the prostitutes on the corner. They start coming to the corner uh, all times, of day and night, yeah. and so the solution at that time, we'll move my granddaughter down to Antioch Baptist Church. And then I go, no, 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 you should move the prostitute, <laughs> not my granddaughter. So, so I became, that's the spark right there. <laughs> so I became involved in a group called the CRA, which is the Community Redevelopment Agency, some folks say area. And it had six components uh, to deal with some of the problems in areas uh, like West Augustine, which is considered uh, LMI, low to moderate income area. So I became very active in that movement. And we, we have the corner back, by the way. The prostitute's yeah. gone, and the kid's back on the oh, corner. That's All right? Good. That's good. That's good. So, so I, 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 guess, I guess that first victory really said, yo, this works. It works. Mm -hmm. Because through that organization, if I'm, if, I'm, if I'm correct, you brought the dollar store exactly. into that area. You brought the Salomon Cal Calhoun, Salomon Calhoun Center, Center, which I go pool, swimming with my son. And the and pool. pool. Exactly. And, and the retention ponds now that hold Opposed that whole area. Yes, so, so they're, they're, it's slow, but something's happening. It, it's moving. The, the greatest hurdle with the community center uh, was getting the administration, as well as the Board of County Commission during that era, uh, to say it's going to be utilized. And Congressman, past Congressman Johnny L. Micah, and State Representative, past State Representative Tony Hill, they actually bought the first funds from the state as well as the federal level to leverage some of the revenue to come up with the Solomon Calhoun Center in Pooh. Well, we worked and we were able to negotiate to get the Calhoun Center. But we had a couple of commissioners who was a little concerned about the pool. And the CRA at that time said, listen, we've lost too many kids in my era to the pool. The Baldwin girl, Tyrone Bell, John Adams, uh, mm -hmm. the Mem brothers, uh, I can go on and on and on. And so we had that discussion with one of the commissioners, and at that time, that past commissioner, and he kept saying liability, liability, liability. 
And so we finally asked that commissioner, what price do you put on one's life so we can address that number of liability? Checkmate. We got the Calhoun Center as well as the pool. Yeah. <laughs> oh boy, if logic worked that well every time, <laughs> I tell you what. So, so now the, the, the CRA is still active today? Oh, very, oh yes, yes, mm -hmm. the chairman is uh, uh, Robert Nemmons and the co-chair is uh, Mr. Waller Willis and uh, they have a chair, chairman of the other groups uh, on the six components. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. to answer your question, yes indeed, it is mm -hmm. still active. Uh, the goal now is to bring a medical complex in West Augustine that's gonna serve not only Medicare, Medicaid, but all folks People. that need uh, medical. And that's, mm -hmm. that's what we're working on now, now. As, as we said. Right. Now, now, in our discussion, we were talking that, you know, I said to you, you know, I go to all these events. I go to opera, I go to ballet, I go to all these things. And I don't see black folks. Mm -hmm. And you would say, well, well they're leaving, dude. The, 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 the people in that age group, which are not elderly or very young, are, are, there's been a plight of leaving. And you were saying the percentages of of black population lost. Right, if you look at the 2000 census, African American population in St. John's County was 6.7%. Right. 10 years later, in the 2010 census, it dropped down to 5.6%. The only county in the 67 counties that lost a whole percentage point mm -hmm. of African Americans, okay? Mm -hmm. The U.S. Department of Labor summons our group, the CRA, to Jacksonville and we said it and we brainstormed and we were trying to figure out okay why out of 67 counties St. John was the only one that lost this much mm -hmm. as far as the population. Uh, we don't have a definitive answer of course but we, we threw a lot on the table mm -hmm. and I think it's been a benefit. But let's fast forward in the 2020 census we're down to 4.6 or 4.7%. Wow. So you still see that decrease. They're leaving. You know? Where are these people going? Well. Flagler County for one, Duval County, Putnam County, Clay County, and then in some cases, of course, northern states yeah, still, New Jersey, New York, mm -hmm. et cetera. Atlanta is a big a, magnet. Especially Atlanta. It's a big magnet. Lots especially of, lots of Atlanta, mm -hmm. exactly. Yeah, people are looking for good jobs. And they're looking for gainful employment. Yes. That's the key word. Yes. We want that gainful employment. Right, right, right. So the other thing we were talking, which to me was kind of scary, is that the, the part of the city that's, that's east of, of US-1 mm -hmm. is, is starting to flood. And it's, it's starting to, they're climate change believers now, mm -hmm. but your part doesn't flood. Right. So it makes sense that if there is any relocation of people or whatever, they would want to go into that area that doesn't flood to stay in the St. Augustine area. Well, I've always had this saying, if you know me for more than five minutes, if the east side of US-1 is historic, then the west side got to be historic, okay? <laughs> if, you know, and, 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 and I said this to several groups. I said, well, you know, in 1565, you know, Ponce de Leon and I was on the Bayfront. I said, man, this is a big hurricane coming, Doc. I said, we, we, we got to move. I said, which direction you think we should go? And by all means, he said, let's go west. <laughs> let's go west. Let's go west. So. Uh, that's funny. That's funny. The, the, now, if you could, if you had the power, the money, the influence, and the political connections to turn West St. Augustine into to something more than it is now, what would that dream be? What would you, what would you like? Well, one would be, how do we capture the history of the African Americans in, uh, in West Augustine? Now, I heard about uh, Travis Lane, Blanche Lane, okay, and, and, uh, and the house of ladies, we'll call it like that, okay? Yeah. Well, <laughs> this was uh, ironic, was in West Augustine, okay? Mm -hmm. That's, that's history, of course. It was booming. It, it was booming. Was well, that's a nice yeah. way to put it. You, yeah. those, those, <laughs> those, that be, those guys that been in Vietnam, they simply say boom, boom. So, uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> if I had to make a wish, mm -hmm. it would be for our powers to be to capture that great history mm -hmm. that West Augustine have before it's too late. You have that great cemetery on the side. Uh, the Buffalo a, Soldiers 
uh, buried there. Some it's really historic it's people, and, and no one really takes a tour there. You know yeah, the Sastabaston Cemetery, which connects to Pinehurst, which is next door to Evergreen, they actually have the, the tombstones of the Civil, the, the Civil War soldiers mm -hmm. at that particular cemetery. Right. Right. Okay, and it's earmarked U.S. colored soldiers. That's how the tombstone reads. Wow. So th that certainly is, is an awful lot yes. of history, of course. But then not only that, the godfather of the civil rights movement, Dr. Robert Haling, actually lived in West Augustine, not too far from Blanche Lane. Mm -hmm. So we certainly, we certainly want to capture that history. Mm -hmm. So if I had to take a magic wand, I would say let's capture the history, mm -hmm. okay, and let's bring the tour trains Across West the across the tracks, one. Mm -hmm. across the tracks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and and and, and, and also start putting uh, plaques, you know, plaques of, of of the what these places are there. Because yes, how is it that all the history is on the other side of US one? You know, exactly. it, it reminds me once I got on a Romanian airline when Ceausescu was being killed, and I was caught in Bucharest, and I had to get out. And I remember uh, they put us in a plane where the the seats were missing the backs, or there were no mm. seat belts, or a whole seat was missing, and the plane is starting wants to leave quickly. And I remember the stewardess comes and she stands in the middle, and in her very bad English says, "Okay." This side is smoking. This side is non-smoking. <laughs> you know? And uh, and I looked up to see if I would see the largest fans in the world over my head, and that was not. And that's almost like that. This side is smoking. This side is non-smoking. You know, okay. it has to be. You know what I'm saying? But um, you know, but do do you do you think the challenge is to try to retain the young people that are still there? That's a, a large challenge uh, to keep the young people there. If the windows of opportunity open up in Atlanta, mm -hmm. then you got to go to Atlanta. Yes. Okay. Uh, if you look at tourism, it's no African Americans capture any revenue of tourism, and that's part of the largest, one of the largest income True. that comes into St. John's County. Now, of course, we got the surrounding areas now. I mean, I mean St. John's County is booming. Uh, so there is gainful employment, uh, per se, outside of close to the city limits right. itself. Right. So it's changing. Every, everything changes. Mm -hmm. Life is mm -hmm. going to change. Now, now where are you, how many children do you have? I have four kids, but don't ask me great grands and grands because it's in double digits. Okay? <laughs> Both of them are. That's yeah. great. Yeah. That's great. I think you'd be a great grandpa. And, uh, <laughs> and, and are, your, are your kids here? Uh, I, uh, three of them are. And I have a daughter that, that actually moved to Palm Coast. Uh, she okay. was able to get a house there. And the other three actually live here in St. Augustine as well. Oh, wow. That's great. Great. Listen, I, I could talk to you all day, all night. Uh, mm -hmm. I loved our conversation. I, I admire you for your persistence, for your hope, your optimism. Thank and, you. And, and you are making change. I know it's a slow pace. But if there aren't people like you and the other members of the, of the CRA, I mean... I mean, we're, you know, so you have to, you have to say thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, my friend. Quite welcome, thank my you. friend. All right. We're going to take an intermission, and uh, we'll be back. We'll be back.
We're back, ladies and gentlemen. I, I, um, I want to excuse my third guest, who was supposed to come after Vicki Lynn Kloger here, representing Hope Across the Globe. We're going to talk a little bit about that. He, he was supposed to come here representing the St. Augustine Music Hall of Fame. Very great uh, musician and, and person behind that. But he had a fever of like 102, 103. Oh, no. And I said, you stay home, boy. <laughs> so he'll be here March 8th. And uh, hope he gets well. Uh, Walter, cool Wookie, if you see us, you get better, my friend. You get better, okay? All right. <laughs> so I'm here with Vicki Lynn Kloger, correct? Correct. And you are with the organization Hope Across the Globe. Right. And you guys are stationed in Jacksonville? Are That's you? our main office. That's your main office. And uh, what is your position with the organization? Uh, I'm the CEO. You're the CEO. You're you're the the buck stops here. It's a small organization. Uh huh. Uh huh. Now, what is the goal of your organization? Our goal is to eradicate HIV, hepatitis C, and sexually transmitted diseases for future generations. Mmm. That is. <laughs> I, I I guess I guess I was scarred by HIV living in New York at the height of it because I had so many friends. Uh, that I knew because I was an actor at the time and they were choreographers and musicians and, and to see them just die one by one um, in such a horrible way really scarred me and it left me very angry <clears throat> but um, going back to you how is it that your organization then helps people? Um, I can start with infants and, and go up to, to the elderly okay a lot of people don't realize that um, HIV still can be passed from mother to child, mm -hmm. but also that there are ways to avoid that spread. An HIV man, HIV woman can have an HIV negative baby if we mm. take proper precautions mm. and we cannot, uh, bre they cannot breastfeed. Okay. So if you look at the commercials that are on TV and they talk about the virus cannot be spread by sexual activity, that mm -hmm. is true. They've not found a way, we've not found a way to avoid spreading the virus through mother's milk. Mm. It's a white blood count. Oh, wow. So what we do is work with the infrastructure to medicate the father, the mother, and to provide alternatives to breastfeeding. All right. What is really scary but also exciting is the death rates for untreated infants. It used to be that moms had to give permission for HIV tests. It's no longer the case. You will be tested if you're pregnant going through the healthcare mm. system. Yay. Thank you. Routine. If a child is born with HIV and receives no treatment, that child has a 50% chance of dying by age two. Wow. If a child is not treated and lives to age four, 80% of them die without treatment. Wow. With treatment, they will have the same life expectancy as the rest of us. Wow. Wow. They're, they're, they're all these great drugs. Yeah. Now, now, to supply drugs and treatment to lower income people is very difficult. So how does your organization reach, reach the poor? Perfect question. <laughs> Thank you. So the, the way that we're funded, um, we are a 501c3 organization. Um, we probably spend about 12 to 15 percent on overhead and the rest is taking care of our patients. We buy insurance for people, we buy medication for people, we address all the social issues that we can to that get in the way of living a healthy, productive life. Mm. We will provide formula, mm. supportive services. Uh, probably our biggest challenge is housing. Northeast Florida is right. such a hot market right yes. now. Education. Yeah. If you don't test, you don't know. And if you don't know, it doesn't mean it's not there. Right, right, yeah. Sticking your head in the sand like an ostrich doesn't... Uh... So we, we take care of people regardless of payer source. If they don't have insurance, we take care of them anyway. If we can buy them insurance, actually we use a great broker here in St. Augustine. If we can buy them insurance, we will buy insurance for them. Wow. If not, we pay hospital bills, we pay for medication, we pay for testing and treatment. Wow, wow. That's, that's what I'm saying, you know, because... It, you know, it, it, it's easy to say, well, you need to take this medication or you need this treatment, but the question is, if you're poor, it says, well, who's going to pay for it? Because I make, a, you know, I make 10 bucks an hour <laughs> and, and, and live in a, in a garage. 
So um, I think I think you know organizations like yours are, are very powerful. Now, are, are you in other states? Are you just based here in Northeast Florida? We are just based in Northeast Florida. We have offices in Jacksonville, St. Augustine, and Port Orange. All right. So anyone who wanted information for themselves or someone else would go to these offices. They can call us. They can check out our website and come in for testing. Mm -hmm. um, we are hampered by uh, some of the rules. So children. Mm. Students, um, we're not allowed to talk about sex. That's a four-letter word. Mm. And so we can't talk about treatment. We're not allowed to talk. When we present to high schools, we're not allowed to talk about condom use. Wow. Um, so yeah. Um, yeah. we have to have an, uh, an underground almost in, in taking care of it. But right. we're happy to test. We're happy to treat. We're happier to avoid. Right. We it's, provide condoms. It, it's crazy in a country like ours that you can't, advertise a burger without having a half-naked girl uh, having this juicy burger um, that you can't mention these sexual quotations. It's the Puritan. I think someone was talking about that before. It's yeah. the Puritan. It's, you know, if you don't say it, it's not happening. And I think a lot of people think automatically, oh, that is a white gay guy's disease. Uh, yeah. the, the number of women that have been tested that come up positive, reactive to the test, and they look at me and they say, he didn't look like. And uh -huh. I said, what does it look like? <laughs> and it and looks like all of us. Wow. Well, I thank you so much. And your website is what? It's um, www.hopeacrosstheglobe.org. Hopeacrosstheglobe.org. So if you need anyone you know who is looking for information, please um, give that out. That information, they're here in St. Augustine, they're in Jacksonville, and? And in Port Orange. In Port Orange. St. Augustine is our only MedPeds oh. uh, service. We treat from nine hours to 99 million years old. Oh, wow. So. Okay. All right. So thank you so much. Thank you. We'll be right back after these messages. So the carpet baggers, who came up with that name? I'm from the north. What's going on here? Dave did. Actually, Jim DeVito. Yeah, Jimmy DeVito, nice Irish boy. Uh-huh. All right. So <laughs> why that name? Because you know it what? I because I was a, a little late um, bloomer in the band, so I don't know what what um, brought it about. Pass a, pa pass a mic. Yeah, sorry, my voice isn't working so good tonight, but uh. When we first moved to St. Augustine years ago, my brother and I came here in 1988, I guess, and we started playing. When we started playing, we took every gig we could. We were hungry. We, anybody to offer us a gig, we would play it. And all the local guys would go, I am damn carpetbaggers. They'd come in here and take in all our work. <laughs> and DeVito told me that when we were recording, we were doing our album, I'm like, that sounds like a pretty good name for a group. He goes, uh -huh. you're kidding me. But anyway, Jim DeVito. All right. Pass the mic here. Y your name is? David. David. And you're? Tony. Joan? Tony. Tony. I mean, Tony? <laughs> Sue. See, I was going to say, Joan, what's going on here? Okay. <laughs> Sue. Frankie. Frankie, yeah. All right. My favorite cousin was named Frankie. Yeah. He was a troublemaker, though. Um, <laughs> cops so were always he. looking for him. He's a all oh, right, that's you. So it runs in the Frankie, uh, whatever. Yes, uh -huh. Frankie family. Yes. So tell me now, how long have you been together as a group? Three or four years, right? Yeah. Use the mic, use the mic. It, it, started, it started out as, actually, it's, it's, a, it's a short story that'll take a long time. It started out as Dave just being a single act, and I had played in a lot of bands with Dave, so he invited me down to the place he was playing and it became a duo. And then we used a lot of a couple different guitar players, but I told him about Tony, my fellow Buffalonian. <laughs> Woo! Go Bills! And um, and Tony joined the group. And then we were lucky enough, um, maybe a year to two, maybe a year and a half after that, Sue 
who had been play who's played pretty much with everybody. She's an amazing um, your, Juilliard your, graduate. Your violin is beautiful. Yes, beautiful. she's amazing. She's <laughs> nicknamed by Tony the Queen Bee. Ah, the Queen Bee. We are just worker bees. Oh. And um, about she had um, moved here from Maui, Hawaii, with her husband Wayne, who's part of the band too, actually. And um, so I'd say together as a, as three about four years. Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. So um, where can we get your music, people? Carpetbaggers.com, right? Carpetbaggers.com. Okay. So you'll play something for us? Absolutely. All right. Let's get this stage. Thanks, Jorge. Right. Tracy oh. has a birthday. <laughs> yeah. On Valentine's Day is your birthday? Is that it? Everybody wants me to tell that Tracy's birthday is on Valentine's Day. Yeah. Okay, all right. All right. So people, I will close the show with this a wonderful, wonderful, incredible band, the Carpetbaggers. Thanks, Jorge. Just real quick, with all this going on in the world, um, about a year ago we put this song um, together, and it's a song by Lee Greenwood. Everybody will know it. If you want to sing along with us, feel free. One, two, three. <laughs>
thank all our guests, Ann Colby. I want to thank uh, Greg White. I want to thank the uh, uh, Vicky Lynn Plugger on uh, Hope Across the Globe. I want to thank my Latina king, queens that run the cameras, my U.S. Marine back there, Amy at the lights. And uh, thank you, thank you. Great show. And God bless America. See you next week. Switching the rest to live with them, to live with them All of my tattoos it connected does, does it? Disconnect, 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 disconnect.